We're going to go ahead and get started. I think it's about 10 or 12 after, so uh, I, I know everyone in the room, but I'm Brian Puckett, and I want to welcome you to our, uh, to our kickoff report this year, help you get some good information. If not, looks like everybody's got a little bit of good food and wine, so just keep drinking, and it'll be good stuff the, 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 the more you have. As we like to do this a little informal, so if you have any, you know, if you have a question about anything we're talking about as we go, just raise your hand, chances are. If you've got, if you know, you think we've been a little bit unclear, there's somebody else in the room that is thinking the exact same thing. So just raise your hand as we, as we go through, and uh, we'll kind of do it that way. But but we'll try to wrap up uh, our prepared remarks in, in about in about one hour. A um, little bit of. Uh, uh, Important legal disclosures from the lawyers. We do have a hard copy of this exciting reading for you. You can pick one up from Debbie as you, as you, as you leave if you want some, some uh, material to help you sleep tonight. But uh, no, Dennis, can you give us a little update on the, uh, on the firm and maybe the agenda, what we're, gonna, what we're gonna cover today? Yeah, so just a quick update on the firm. Um, right now we work for 175 families. We're managing about $225 million and been in business 24 years. And more importantly, some of you might notice, we finally got our picture updated, so Laura's in the picture now. So it took us about a year to get that done, so we finally got that done. And as uh, John mentioned before, it's obviously <laughs> been heavily Photoshopped, so I don't know if you try to compare about. that to this, I mean, it doesn't really kind of match up. Thanks, but we do have, we have a great photographer <laughs> if you need one. Yeah. You made all of us look good. That's hard to do. Um, so what we're going to cover today, first we'll start with just a market update. What happened in 2016? What, you know, what headlines dominate the news? I think you know which ones probably. Uh, then we'll go over just a performance review of the components in the portfolio, what the performance was, why we saw the performance we did, what happened um, in 2016. Then we'll cover effective tax strategies that we utilize for all of you um, called, called tax law allocation. We've gone over this a few times before, but we're still getting questions on it on you know why is the performance different in different accounts or why did I hold this in this account and not this account. Um, so we're going to approach it a little bit different this time and show you like a real world uh, example of here's how it, if we just did it straight across the board here's how we do it and here's why and here's how it benefits you in taxes. Then finally um, Travis Romine who's the head trainer here at Oak Tree is going to come up and cover some fitness and nutrition uh, things to help you know all of us stay active and, and uh, stay healthy. I need us some help in that, so I'm looking forward to that. And then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Most everybody has, a, has read a copy, I think, of our investment philosophy brochure. What you may or may not know is that we update that about every six to eight months. So I'd encourage all you guys, if you haven't gone back and taken a look at it, we think it does a really good job of explaining you know, in just plain English, here's our strategy and here's what we're doing. A lot of times I, I kind of make an analogy of it's sort of like a playbook. I mean, you guys own the team. This is your money. We never forget that. We're sort of the coach, and that's our playbook. So I would really encourage you guys to maybe go to the website, alignmywealth.com, and download the most current version. Um, uh, and and, and it's, it's a good little refresher. So it'll cover everything we talk about today and, and, and more. Yeah, so two th what about 2016? What a year, huh? Uh, started off, you know, the first, I don't know, three, uh, six weeks, I guess. Uh, uh, the media was just all over the place saying it's the worst six weeks in the history of the equity markets. And I think that the Dow and the S&P uh, declined from the end of 2015 to about February 11th or 12th, uh, they gave up about 11%. So it was an ugly start to the, to the beginning of the year. But I might remind you guys of a statistic that, that we've covered over and over and over again, and that is that going back to 1980, the average entry year decline for the U.S. stock market, does anyone remember? 14% on average. On an annualized basis, going back more than 36 years, the stock market declines on average 14% in any given year. So really, the media blowing up the fact that this is the worst you know, start to the equity markets in the, since they've been tracked was really not that far out of line. It was just something for them to write, write about. Now, something did happen around June. We all remember probably the whole thing that the media uh, termed Brexit. but. 
uh, Britain voted to leave the European Union, and that was a very surprising thing for the markets, and the markets gave up about 6% in about one and a half trading days. I mean, it was just like, wow, that happened. The markets, markets do not like uh, surprises. So one, one of the... One of the good things that's happened is now we know who the president is, and that's no small thing because that uncertainty is out of the way. No matter you know which side you fall on, the fact that we now know with certainty here's the new administration is is probably is probably a good thing for the financial markets. Nonetheless, I won't forget that you know on uh, I guess it was about 2 a.m. on uh, November the 9th. My cell phone gets a text message from a guy who's obviously beyond nervous saying, well, it's happening, you know, the Dow's off 800 points. I'm like, well, the Dow's not open yet, buddy. <laughs> but, the, you know, the futures were off 800 points, and, and, and thank goodness that, that didn't happen during the normal trading day. So there was all that stuff, but by the end of the year, the market on a capital appreciation basis had gone up 10 percentage points tack on 2% in uh, dividends, 12%, you know, pretty decent year by, by any mo anyone's measure. And I, you know, I think it's a, the market kind of put on a tutorial that maybe the next time the media starts to preach about, you know, the current end of the world, <coughs> it may not, in fact, turn out to be the end of the world. And a lot of times, our best investment advice during those times is, you know, turn off the darn TV. Turn off Jim Cramer, you know. Be careful where your web browser goes, because it's not, you know, it's, it's usually not very good for your financial health, so. Yeah, we always say that the best three words we always say is, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do that if I were you, but. So here's a breakdown of what the different markets across the globe did in 2016. You see something happened that doesn't usually happen. They are all went up over the year. I uh, see that U.S. stocks did up, like Brian said, a little over 12%. International continues to be a laggard. It's only up two and a half, two and three quarters. Emerging markets finally saw a good year, so did it a little above average, 11%. And that's another one that if you watch it, it'll drive you nuts. I mean, at the beginning of the year, it was down about 14%. Six months later, it was up 25%, and then it finished up 11%, just all over the place. Uh, real estate, same thing. It started off about 10%, went up 25%, ended up 5 And then global bonds had a rough, or just, I'm sorry, U.S. bonds had a rough uh, end of the year with the election. We saw rates start to change, and, and uh, they had finished up a little over 2%. But more importantly than what the markets did, below here are the components that we all own. Now, if you remember, we own the exact same thing you guys own. So we own these funds as well. And we've just matched up, okay, in that market, what's the holding that matches up with that? And how did we do? How, did we keep up with the market returns? So you see in US stocks, the US core did 16 and a half versus 12, so it outperformed it. You'll see a few of these outperform, and really, that's not, we didn't go pick the best stocks or anything like that. You know, we don't try to market time or pick the best stocks or anything. This year is due to, we tilt the portfolios a little bit towards small caps and value stocks more than the market. We own a higher percentage in your portfolio than the market holds. This year paid off. And so we saw that in U.S. International, International doubled the performance because small caps did really well. Emerging markets, we outperformed it by about a percent because value stocks did real well in emerging <coughs> markets. And then, uh, step back so you can see. Real estate, we slightly outperformed it by about a percent and right in line in the bond market. We'll probably be under it. That's not surprising. I think we're under, what, 0.1% because we hold a little higher quality short-term bonds than the overall U.S. bond market because that's, that's our safe money. We're not trying to make money there. So this breaks those open. These are the asset classes in those funds. And I kind of want to show you what I was talking about. I said we tilt towards small in value. You see the US value, 31% return. So they did really well last year. Um, so what we get is sometimes we'll get up here and talk about small caps, large caps. And we get, OK, what's a small cap stock? What's a value stock? So I wanted to give you, you know, small cap is less than a billion or $2 billion. So they're smaller companies. You don't know most of them. You own about 1,800 of them. And I went through and looked at, okay, let's look at the first 200. There's very few you've probably even heard of. 
such as uh, Group One Automotive, which owns Bob Howard, um, Abercrombie and Fitch, Barnes and Noble, Briggs and Stratton, and Wendy's. So I mean, Wendy's was up 27 percent, Briggs and Stratton 32. Who would, I mean, you don't ever see them on TV saying pick Briggs and Stratton and Wendy's. I mean, it doesn't happen. And your, the largest three holdings, I thought this was interesting, was Patterson <coughs> UTI Energy, Oasis Petroleum, and Synex. Who would have picked those? I mean, anyone in this room? They were up 79, 180, and 41% in 2016. So, but then you can have an Abercrombie and Fitch that goes down 52% too. So that's why you own 1,800 of them. We're not going to try to pick which, one's, which one does the best. Um, really, that's all I want to pick up. You see right here in the middle, though, S&P 500, a little better than average. It averages about 10%. It was up 11.9. So, it, you know, again, that's, that's where we had the outperformance of all these asset classes up there. So that's why we own all these. We don't know when it's going to happen. But, on, you know, over time, you'll get about a 3% premium, 3% more than just on the S&P 500. Yeah, so as, uh, as Dennis was talking about, and we preached this for years and years, we, uh, we tend to tilt the equity portion of, of, our, of your money, your portfolios, towards small and, and value stocks. And the reason that we do that is there's just decades and decades of pretty robust academic research that says that there are premium returns to be captured if you'll invest in these smaller and value-oriented companies. And value-oriented, I mean, I don't want you to, all to get me wrong. That's a kind of a Wall Street word, but value means, uh, value means that the price is pretty low compared to the book value of the company. And that only happens when, like, there's bad news about a company or something like that. To short-circuit all that, the small and the value stocks are basically the smallest, crappiest companies there are. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, not to mince words, but that's, that's why we earn a higher return there. No one's going to invest in small, crappy companies unless they're going to get paid a premium for doing so. However, some of those small, crappy companies are going to go out of business, so we own a whole lot of them. And they're also going to bounce around a lot. So we don't see the small and the value premiums. Here's the key to the small and value premiums. The only way to capture them is to have just incredible discipline and a pretty, you know, refined strategy so that you're there when the returns come because they, uh, they, they come just when you least expect it. They're very unpredictable, but boy, when they come, they're worth, they can be very profitable. So, uh, and the market's really kind of put on another tutorial here in the area of the importance of being patient and waiting for these returns to show up. So if you take a look up here, I, we're, our presentation is just a little bit technical today, but basically, in a nutshell, what we have up here is the Russell 3000, and that's the whole U.S. stock market, okay? The Russell 1000 are the largest companies, and the Russell 2000 are the smallest 2000 companies out of the Russell 3000. You with me? So what you see up here is that the largest 1,000 through October earned 5.8. The smallest 2,000 out of the whole stock market, 6. The bottom line is the small cap premium, if you took the risk of investing in small cap stocks, you got paid a whopping 0.35% for the first 10 months of the year. So if you gave up then and said, well, you know, I'm not getting hardly anything for taking the risk of investing in small companies versus great big huge companies. That was short-sighted, because look what you missed. Here, the small cap premium gave you 0.35. If you just held out another two months, that's where all the, you know, all the payoff came in just those last 60 days. And it was just boom, 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 boom. And it was really, it was really only about five or six days, to be quite <laughs> frank with right. you. And if you weren't there to get those on those five or six days, you just missed it. And you shouldn't have taken the risk of being in those smaller companies. So. Uh, I guess I would end the discussion of these uh, data by saying, you know, thank you so much for, you know, being patient and uh, allowing us to pursue these small cap premiums for you. Um, I know it takes a lot of trust and uh, I hope you find it's been worth the wait because that was really a, that was a nice little payoff at the end of the year there, so, or we thought it was, so. I'll take it. Um, before we go to the next slide, no. I just want you guys to imagine you're out driving around at night, and uh, you do what I do. My wife can attest to this. You're just not paying attention, and you're thinking about something else, and you end up out in the middle of nowhere, and, and uh, <laughs> don't know where you are, right? I, yeah, I do that. I'll miss my exit, and three exits later, I 
turn it over and I don't know where I'm at. So let's say your phone's dead, you don't have a GPS, you don't have a compass, you don't have a map, you don't know where you're at, you decide I'm, gonna, I'm just going to drive. I'm gonna, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know where I'm at, I'm going to drive. And so you just keep driving and after a while you see a mile marker. Mile marker 32. Then you drive a little bit longer, you see 33, 34. So you've got an idea of what now? Where you're at. Do you know where you're going? Does anyone know where you're going just based on that? Away from one. Yeah, you're going away from one. That's about it. Roam of the range. Yeah, so you just know where you're at. You know where you're going. This is no different. Right? It's just a number. But the media's not going to let you forget that. It's going to be, we're going to see this, you know, 20,000. Do you get in, in or out now? Because it's a, you know, this number is a nice round number, so now's the time to decide if you get in or out, I guess. I don't, I don't, I don't know why. <coughs> CNN, they have that exact same one founded at 20,000, at 19,000, at 18,000, at 17,000, at 16,000, <laughs> all the same ones. They've got the same questions, the same thing. <laughs> it, it, it tells us nothing. What we're worried about is, okay, wh where do we go from here? We're not going to base it on that. Okay, yeah, it, it's an all-time high. Okay, so let's look at, okay, where we're going, you know, what's the probability it will go higher? So I've got a quiz for you. So from 1926 to 2016, after the S&P 500 reaches a new high, what percentage of the time is it even higher one year later? So how many of you think 25%, as high as 25? No one? Not even 25% of the time? At least 25%. 25% of the time, at least 25% it's higher a year later. Got a couple. Anyone 50? We can't get 25? This is participatory. Anyone 50? want to take 50% odds? 75? Mickey. Wow. You must, you know math or something? Here's your answer. 81% of the time. So you hit an all-time high. 81% of the time, a year later, it's even higher. So if you get that one that said you buy or sell, if you sell, you're taking the 19% probability it'll be lower instead of the 81% chance. And that's our job is to just, we're here to help you fund your cash flows, your, your goals. What do you want to do? When do you want to do it? We're going to take the 81% probability for you. And here's a few other things I thought kind of maybe will help this because we'll go through to get at 21,000 and at 22,000 and it'll keep going. So since 1950, there's been more than 1,100 all-time high closings in a day in the S&P 500. That's one out of every 14 days on average. So one every 14 days we hit another high, another high. Smashing and you, news. And if you look back to 1926, 319 months ended in an all-time high. That's about one-third of them. So from 1926, a third of the time we're at an all-time high. So that really, it doesn't mean anything. The good news is that's one year. We, you know we don't plan for one year. We plan for the long term. So the longer time frame you get, that probability gets even better. So that's, you know, five years, it's 85%. We get into, you hear us talking about, okay, we're planning for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. You get into 10 years, now it's 92% of the time. And if you really look at this, something that kind of stuck out to me was, okay, now you've only got an 8% probability of having a negative return over a 10 year time. That really happened from the Great Depression right there. So if you invested then, the next 10 years you, you didn't see a positive return. And of course, it put money in right before the tech bubble bust. And you went through 2001, 2002, and 2008. That's what it took not to have a positive return over a 10-year period. That's really two times it's happened, and two of the worst markets we've ever seen. So, I mean, to us, this is, you know, this is what we're looking at. We're not going to just base it on what the headlines are saying, or 20, it's 20,000, that seems high, let's get out, because it's the highest it's ever been. We know 92% of the time it's going to be higher 10 years later when you need that money, when we need to help you fund your cash flows. <clears throat> when you hit retirement and we want, you need, want us to start sending a check, this is the best way for us to get that return. I, 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 just one more thing about this Dow 20,000. I mean, I, I, actually, I've not um, 
I haven't had anyone in this room, I haven't had any client ask me, hey, the market's at an all-time high, 20,000, should we get out? I mean, I've, I've had that question like at a party or something, yeah. but not from many of our clients. So I know we're <laughs> kind of preaching to the choir. But one of the things that we have gotten questions about, so the next time somebody, you know, you hear this headline of Dow, the, you know, the Dow's at now 25,000, after you say to yourself, well, so what? You might say, well, you know, or the, when they say the market is at an all-time high, that's where, you know, the, the, you know, the market. So you might ask yourself, well, what market? And just remind yourself that as a client of a line, I mean, you own like 12, you own the stocks and bonds of more than 12,000 companies and governments in like 44 countries worldwide. So to compare the Dow, 30 companies, to your portfolio, stocks and bonds of 12,000 companies and governments. I mean, it's just apples to oranges. It's just not even a, you know, it's just not a valid comparison. I, you know, I, item number one. One of the main reasons though, and a lot of people say, well, why are we even bothering investing overseas? Because international stocks haven't performed as well as U.S. stocks recently. And, you know, one of the very main reasons that we do that is to comply with, you know, we never forget that this is your money, this is not our money. And one of our long-term mantras that every one of you probably have heard us talk about is, we believe in this idea of let's manage this money for the downside, the upside takes care of itself. If we manage the money for the downside and minimize the risk, the upside takes care of itself. And the data is very clear. I mean, the academic data is crystal clear that a globally diversified strategy with investing in many more markets and many more companies is much less risky than investing in a smaller number of companies in just one country. As, you know, as comfortable as it is to invest only in the United States, the fact of the matter is the data says that it's a more risky strategy. But when the US, the S&P has beaten developed uh, international stocks for the past four years, as it has, emerging markets finally beat the S&P last year, but you know, in, international stocks have still lagged U.S. stocks. We have, this is a tough room sometimes. We got some tough, very smart clients and they make us better at our job. I'm not <laughs> saying you're tough, don't be tough. I'm saying it makes us better, but there are a lot of clients that say, well, yeah, the risk is good. I like you to hold down the risk, but I want performance. And if you don't perform, I like you, but I'm going to leave you. So I want to talk a little bit about why we're continuing to do this. And on this next slide, th this really tells the whole picture. <laughs> this is what's happened with like the blue line is a globally diversified portfolio invested pretty much just like your stock portfolio is in your Align Wealth Management account. Now, so I know some of you have you know, 60% stocks and some of you have 80% stocks and I have 80% stocks and some of you have 50% stocks. But it doesn't matter. The portion of your stocks is it basically invested in a portfolio just like this line. And this goes back to 1970. And here is your global portfolio. Here is a US only portfolio. It might have felt more comfortable because you're more familiar with it and you could pull up the, you know, the prospectus and you actually recognize most of the names in that thing. But here's the bottom line. Would you, be, would you rather invest in a pure U.S. portfolio and end up with, what is that, $90? No, oh yeah, the, which one? Yeah, 89. Yeah. Or would you prefer to have a global portfolio and end up with $350? What do you think? $350 or $90? All right. So that's the data. And that's, you know, you consider this. That's a pretty long, it's an extremely varied, and therefore it's a pretty meaningful piece of data. Wouldn't you agree? 45 years. Let's take it one step further. How many people in this room believe that the whole world is getting more global on almost a daily basis? So, that. That's why we invest globally. It just, it, that, that's what the data says we ought to do. That's the prudent approach. Uh, things will turn around. You know, international stocks will beat U.S. stocks. I can't tell you how or why or when that's going to happen, but it's very likely to happen. And, and we want you guys to be, you know, up in this area, not really down in this area. So. So that's based, you know, that's an index is how that, how that works out over a long amount of time. So we wanted to look at, okay, our portfolios, the actual, actual returns, net of all fees, net of fund costs, 
that clients have received, has that matched up the same way? Has that come out the same? And so with this, we've got uh, the, our all equity portfolio, which of course most of you are in, but this is the part you have if you're 60-40, this is the 60% you have in stocks. The, it's the same holdings. So whatever you have in stocks, this is what they've done on it. Uh, so these are the returns since 1999. And then down here, this first line, you might not be able to read it, that's the S&P 500. So this is the US stocks, what they've done each year. And down here is the global stocks, might, without the US in it. So the rest, of the, the rest of the globe. So what you see is, since 1999, the S&P has averaged 5.3%. International has averaged 3.2, and ours has averaged 7.8. And what's weird is if you go through and look at all these years, a third of the time our portfolio has been, had a return less than the S&P 500. But it had a return about 50% more. And it's having, being right there in between. It's not, it's not the highest, we're not trying to, you know, get the highest return international when it does well or vice versa. We're right there in between. And that makes sense? So more importantly, if you look at that, I mean, that's percentages. Let's look at, you know, what happened if you put money in it? So if you put a million dollars into it, here at the beginning in 1999, if you had the S&P 500, you ended up with 2.5 million, <clears throat> and the portfolio that underperformed the S&P 500 a third of the time had 50% more money, 3.8 million. So it, it works out that way. It's kind of like what Brian went over. If you look, go over the, the indexes, how that works, it, it shows that that actually is the way it comes out with the portfolios we're managing. So it's really boring to be a, a client of, of this firm over a short period of time, and sometimes it's very difficult. You gotta, you know, you gotta really believe in the strategy. I mean, I encourage you to go back and look at the strategy book, but it's really, I mean, I find it very, um, I look at some of the uh, clients in this room that have been with us for, you know, 20, 25 years, and some of their, some of their compounding is really starting to get exciting in a big, big way. And they're like able to do things that they never really thought about doing before so it's we get cool little pictures from all over the place and right. I, I, the question I want to ask is based on that uh, what percent of stock and what percent of bond, uh, bonds are you looking at to get that return on that? I'm sorry we didn't make this clear this what yeah. Dennis is doing this up is here is this stocks. is a pure stock portfolio okay. yeah so we've and, got and very few of our clients to be fair with yeah. this are purely in stocks but this is comparing whatever we have that's purely in stocks versus a pure stock index, you know, index. And everyone in the room's got a different mixture of stocks right. and bonds. Where we start out though, Don, is we'll sit down, as, as, as you know, and try to ascertain, okay, what is somebody trying to do? You know, when are they gonna need the money? What are your goals and your objectives and your dollars and your deadlines? And when are you gonna wanna go do that trip? And how much is that gonna cost? And uh, when are you going to need to send that grandkid to college or want to do that or whatever the case may be and then we map out a strategy that has the least amount of risk, tax and cost to accomplish that. And that may end up with like a 50-50 portfolio but you may say well you know I really want to take more risk than that and that's fine but we start off with okay let's design a portfolio that's the, has the highest probability of the client achieving their goals and objectives with the least amount of risk tax and cost and then we sort of work out what the what the uh, you know the, the equity versus bond mix is going to be yes yeah, so is everyone clear on that that this was 100 percent stocks so i know we usually list all of them out on the or a lot a lot of them out so you know this is the one we talked about we own what you own this is the portfolio i own no, I did not put a million dollars into it in 1999. I wish I would have. <laughs> <laughs> Do what? 2008, I think if you, if you had this, you probably jumped out the window, right? No, I had a lot less gray hair in, before 2008. That's what happened. Cool. I'm in this portfolio and I went through 2008. Got <laughs> I got more gray hair. <laughs> now, so, Dennis, uh, go no, ahead. Yeah, you, you another might. thing, so. To, you know, another thing the SEC requires us to, these are actual returns, so we have a disclosure, you can't read it. If you want that one as well, that's also up front. If you want to read that disclosure, we know you're excited to, but uh, we need to make sure you, you know that. But where, let's back up though. What, where, there's two things that I want you to discuss. Number one, in a nutshell, how were these numbers derived? Where did these numbers come from again? Yeah. Number one, and then I can't really, if I'm a math person, 
you mean you've got some of the money in a thing that did 5.3 over this period of time, some of the money in a thing that did 3.2. How did we do that? I don't see how I can average those and get to that. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll cover the first one. The way we do this, so you, you know we send these out and we'll say, okay, here's our returns as of whenever. And we'll have the 100% stocks, 75, 60%, and 40%. That's our really four of our most popular ones. We have a lot in between, but that, it would get really messy if we did all of them. I mean, so, to, I'm sorry, can I interrupt one? Yeah. We run about 20 different portfolios, yeah. kind of model portfolios, and we might even, you know, do an in-between portfolio depending on the client's goals and objectives and risk tolerance and all that kind of stuff. But we have, we have data going back over this. Back to 1999. And the way we do that is for each of those portfolios, we look at all the clients in that mix. And it, and it just runs through, and we have our portfolio management software. We're doing, we're sending you your performance reports every 90 days, or when you log in, you know, whenever you do, every week or month or whatever, and you look at that. So we compile it from that. A third party reconciles all that and says, okay, with all your clients in the 60-40 mix, here's the composite return of what they received: net of all fees, net of funds, cost, everything. And then we plug that in. And so we've got that from an, a third party that does the reconciliation for us is the way that's done. So there might be 10 people in the room that are all in a 60-40 mix, so it would be the composite of all of those, along with any other client that's not in the room that has a 60-40 mix. Well, do, you have a, do you have a chart for the 60-40 mix? Yeah, I do. Up, up front. Yeah, yeah well, we got and, one up front. So that's a good point on it, because the composite of that, and they'll all be a little bit different, because as you know, some of you are take, we're sending you money every month, or every quarter, or every year. Some of you are not. So some, some of you are adding have some, cash some of you some add lump sums. Some of you have added lump sums at unlucky times right. and you got bad timing. Some of you added lump sums right before the market went up. So it's all of it. It's all of it mixed together. It's the whole composite of what the numbers have actually been over time. Does that make sense, Frank? Yeah. I guess I'm going to have to look at my own chart. <laughs> yeah, we, and, and, and Frank, I mean, you know point? we're no. totally an open book, so look at yours, bounce it up against what's on this chart, and we can kind of show you, you know, probably what happened for better or for worse with your particular account. Or I could log in your account right now. We could. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that? Sure. <laughs> just, just kidding. Confidentiality is kind of important, so. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be oh. anybody coming up saying, will you take me on your next trip? <laughs> Uh, so to hit the next thing that Brian mentioned, I'll kind of walk up here. Here's part of it is the rebalancing. We, you know, we we have a little premium we get in that as we rebalance. I'll go more over that later. But it, can you guys read these numbers pretty well? I know these down here maybe a little darker. But if you look like the first year, international is up 28, U.S. up 21. We're right there in between at 25. And then the next year. We, you know, 2000, we did a little better. Real estate helped really well there. Um, 2001 helped us as well. But usually we're going to be right there. Again, down 15, down 22, we're in between. Up 39, up 28, we're in between. Up 20, up 10, we're right there in between. So we're in the middle of these two pretty much every year. So we've got a little bit of a smoother ride. We don't have as big a decline or as big as a bump as the highest one or the lowest one. So by staying right there in between, it's a smoother ride, we end up with more return at the end, less volatility. We end up with more returns. Everybody remembers back in basic geometry, the shortest distance between point A and point B. Straight. 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 It's a line. Straight. And it works. But the rebalancing is really important. So you guys see these little trades in your accounts all the time, and that's where we're just, something shot the lights out. Last year, man, who'd have thunk it? We didn't have any idea that small cap value, all these little bitty small crappy companies were just gonna do way off the charts. But you know what, we'll take it, and we'll take some of those chips off the table, and we'll go buy something that, did, that underperformed that's now cheaper. And so it was really those two things, the, the, the smoother ride, and then the continuous, rebalancing, selling stuff high and buying stuff low, and selling stuff high and buying stuff low that, that resulted in this premium return, or resulted in this really is mm -hmm. what people care about is those dollars. The money. So. This year's a good example. I'm going to go over uh, a fee rebalancing that we did throughout this year. And you see, you know, we've got about half and half, U.S. and global. So U.S. went up 12, international went up 3, so we should have been somewhere around 6 or 7 
and our all equity came out nine. And part of that again was the small cap, but part of it was our rebalancing. We got you know, we just did it based on the allocation. We went over underweight and we we got pretty lucky on the timing on it. Really, there's no big reason for this other than that we've put this in the newsletter a few times and people say they really like to see this. We've been talking about this fund or this asset class or all this. So if we rip open the, these funds that you own, these are top 50 holdings. These are the top 50 companies that you own in your portfolio. The ones in the, that are highlighted in yellow are your international stocks held in the top 50. So you see, of course, the largest you know, company in the world right now is Apple. That's your largest holding right now. But if you went in on the stock portion of the portfolio of what you own, these top 50 only make up about 11 or 12 percent of your stocks. So remember, 12,000 companies, stocks and bonds, 12,000 companies and governments, 44 countries. That's why these top 50 holdings are only 12 percent. So a Apple could go totally out of business and it doesn't yeah. make much of a difference. Of and here's, here's a good example, too, on why we're, we're always doing, when we're doing your cash flow planning, we're looking at, yeah, you're on track, and we can do the probability because we can kind of see how these portfolios are doing because we own these asset classes. We see that asset classes don't go out, of, entire asset classes don't go to zero. But you could have something like, you know, remember BP a couple years ago, that nice oil spill? I mean, that went down, what, 50%? I can't remember exactly, you know, at least. It was a lot. How much did that affect your portfolio? I mean, you really didn't notice it. Now, if we just had all your money in those 50, that would hurt you. Or if you had 10 of those and BP was one of them, you're in trouble. You're not going on that trip next week. But you don't have to worry about that because that's just But a we small did have portion. a client that in, inherited some BP <laughs> shares from her dad. He was a lifelong <laughs> BP man. Yeah. She would not diversify those shares. And it hurt. Are the yellow ones the ones that are doing it? Inter international. Yeah, he's just highlighting those are the, those are the international stocks within the top 50 holdings in the in the portfolio. <clears throat> With Exxon Mobil, because Rex Tillerson is now Secretary of State, that's the one who's the CEO. How's that all going to work out? How's well, uh, see, he, he, really, here's the main point that I would make about that is that. If it's not obvious, you know, our strategy is never to own enough of anything. You're, you're never going to own enough of anything to make a killing. If Exxon goes through the roof and he funnels all the, you know, all, most lucrative oil contracts from around the world to Exxon. But you're never going to own enough of it to get killed if there's another Valdez crash. Okay, so that's the idea. It's just, it's boring. It's singles and doubles and singles and doubles and singles and doubles and that's what wins games. So. Well, and I'll say every no. once in a while you get a home run, but yeah. well, we're not really trying to. <laughs> Those guys strike out a lot. All right, we better move, Dennis. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So what is going on with bonds? Well, it, the, the bond market had one of the toughest markets it's had in like you know 25 years. Uh, actually, had a pretty good year for the first half of the year because. Yields actually declined. Bond prices went up during the first half of the year. Second half of the year, not so much. We had, uh, you know, yields went up. The, the Fed raised interest rates by a quarter percentage point, and that caused at least a temporary, you know, uh, depression in bond prices. The thing that I would um, say, though, it probably gets boring to say it all the time, but you know, I wouldn't do a knee-jerk reaction to this. I mean, just just met with a client this morning who's like, I don't see anything on the horizon that says that interest rates are not going to go up. I mean, especially with Trump in office and all that, all this inflationary stuff, interest rates are going up. You know, there are some of the smartest bond people, the smartest bond mathematicians, the smartest guys that are, you know, running bond portfolios for the biggest pensions and, and insurance companies in the world, they've been trying to predict where interest rates are going for the past 12 years and a lot of them have been going out on a limb saying, well, interest rates have nowhere to go but up and they've just been flat wrong. So, you know, the bottom line is that nobody really knows where interest rates are going to go. We had, we had a pretty big tick, you know, the, uh, if you look at just like 30-year mortgage rates, 30-year mortgage rates, you know, as late as, uh, late in the year is like October were about three and a half. They went up, to, at, at the end of 2016, they went up to about 4.35%. 
I mean, that, that, that may not sound like a lot, but that's a, that's a big number to somebody who's buying a house as far as what their monthly payment's going to be. Now they've drifted back down again. Interest rates could go nowhere but up, according to this guy I was talking to just this morning. So he got out of all his bonds and into money markets and just watch, you know, interest rates floated back down and the value of his bonds that he previously sold would have really made some money. So all I'm trying to say is to do a knee-jerk reaction, thinking that, you know, obviously with the Trump administration, we're going to have higher inflation and high interest rates. Well, you know what? Here's what I would say to that. Who doesn't know that information, mm -hmm. number one? Price down. I mean, that's been all over the media, and Trump's been talking about nothing but, hey, man, we're going to go out and do all this infrastructure spending and, you know, generate all these jobs and do all this inflationary stuff. So, I mean, it's, if you think that that's information that no one else knows, I mean, you know, <laughs> that may be a little bit of a problem. What, so we don't know where interest rates are going one way or another. Here's what I do know is that it's usually pretty smart to own both stocks and bonds in a well-balanced portfolio. Would you agree? And so, Dennis, I, it, you might talk a little bit about how that worked last year. Yeah, so this is another, I mean, 2016 was another great textbook example on diversification and asset classes. If you remember a few years ago, we had these longer term bonds to any portfolio that had 50% or more in stocks. Uh, we had these because they move the opposite of, of equities. It gives us another opportunity to rebalance. So this year is a great example. The brown line up here is global stocks. And you see, you know, as we talked about in January, they started, we had a quick decline. So they started, you know, down. We've just got that right there. The blue line is our, the long-term bond index. So that's uh, the, the 10, 20 year bonds that we bought. The, I'm trying to remember what the fund is called, but. So we added those about a year and a half ago. You see that worked exactly like we wanted. And so it, in rebalancing in January, you may remember, we went and sold some of the blue line, took those gains, went and bought stocks when they were down. Took that game, went and put it right back in the Here. equities while they were down. I mean, th really these, at one point, the, the bonds ran up about 14, 15% while stocks were down 10 or 11. So you'll see those little trades in your account. We're selling this and selling some of this, not all of it. We're not totally getting out of it. We don't have all the answers. We don't know that's just a game. But we're trimming some of that off and we'll buy some of this. Sell high, buy low. Trim some of that off, buy a little bit of this. Yeah, we Trim did it again right here. And some, some of you, we did it again right there, depending on if your portfolio's got a balance enough or not. So that was you know, two times right there, we got it pretty quick. And then what that does is, there's a 60-40 mix right there in between. Remember that smoother line we were just talking about? And that's what happens. You don't get the wild swings of the market or of those bonds, you're right there in between. And that really, really is important when you're on withdrawal and taking money out. That is real important that you minimize the volatility there. Say those were 20 year bonds, we would be better off buying one and two year bonds and laddering them rather than buying 20 year bonds if you were looking at more of a bond portfolio. Laddering is not a bad strategy. I mean, we tend to kind of bucket out the bonds and on some like one to five and one, some five to ten and then maybe some. And we'll own the longer bonds. We really don't own longer bonds except in equity tilted equity and just stock a portion heavy of the bonds. portfolios. Just maybe like in a 60-40, I think only 8% of our bonds are in these long-term bonds. But like in my portfolio, mine is 80-20, and almost all of my 20% is in longer-term bonds, because the main reason is I'm not using those bonds for income. I'm using those bonds for dissimilar price movement. Those longer-term bonds are the ones that really go up when stocks go down. Now, they also really go down when stocks have shot the lights out and we have interest rate increases. So you got to kind of take the good with the bad, as they say. But um, they, they, long-term bonds were up in 2008. I mean, no, Don, a, a bond ladder is not a bad idea as far as a core bond holding for somebody that's you know, done working and done buying, if you will. Yeah, so what if we are, in fact, in a rising interest rate environment? What if all the pundits are right and rates finally are going to start to rise? You know, Trump's going to get everything that he wants. We're going to have inflation and we're going to have higher interest rates. Well, we ought to get out of bonds, right? Because haven't you always heard since you were like old enough to care about money that uh, when interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down? Well, what we did is we went back, and you may have seen this a few years ago, but you know, we're big believers in saying, okay, well, that's what I've heard, 
but I haven't seen the data. Let's look at the data. Data, data, data. If the data says that's true, then yes, we'll accept that's true. But if the data says that's not true, we are not going to accept that. So here's the data. It basically says, here's the myth. The myth is when rates go up, stocks and bonds go down. Here's the reality. Here are the last five uh, interest rate, uh, rising interest rate environments that we've seen. And in four out of five of those, do you see any negative numbers for stocks? I'm sorry, in five out of five. Five out of five, stocks made money. And in four out of five, even bonds, interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down. That may happen in the short term, but remember, when interest rates go up, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it, it, does, it is painful to see a little decline in bonds because that's supposed to be your safe money. You know, I've been doing this, this business now since 1993. And I have consistently heard, you know, because we've seen interest rates, you know, from the time that, that I was in high school. I graduated from Edmond High School in 1981. Interest rates were in the mid-teens, right? Now they've gone down to pretty much zero. So ever since I've been in this business, I've heard from clients, well, I don't even know why you call it fixed income. There's no income in it. It doesn't pay anything. Right? And now we're finally getting some income, but nobody likes it because there was a little bit of a haircut on the bond prices now. But what that means is that, you know, six months from now, you'll start to collect some of those interest payments. And they're going to, if we are in a rising rate environment, maybe those interest payments will get fatter and fatter and fatter. I mean, maybe we'll start to see a money market that pays 3% or 6% or, God forbid, 15% like it did when I was at Edmond Memorial High School. Uh, but he, here's the data, guys, on the last five interest rate, rising interest rate environments. In all of those five, stocks made money, and in four out of five, bonds made money. So it's just not true that, that stocks or bonds lose money when interest rates go up. That, that, those, the, the data says that's not true. So uh, now we're going to hit the tax lot allocation. So we've, again, we've gone over this before. You guys remember seeing this? So the, really the only thing I want to point out on this is we've got all these different type, types of stocks. We've got real estate. You've got some bonds in there. All the income and gains from it, they're taxed differently. So if you look at something like municipal bonds, I mean, you're not gonna, that's, you don't pay any federal tax. You pay a state, so it may cost you 5% you know, tax. If you're in real estate and you get some income from it, it's in a taxable account. Whatever your income tax rate is, you're going to pay that plus some state income tax. You can you know, get in the 30s, 40s, and everything in between. Same thing with some tips and global bonds, things like that. You could pay quite a bit of tax. And so we're, what we're doing is we're looking at, okay, well, something like this, why wouldn't we own all that in a trust account? And something like global bonds or real estate, why wouldn't we own that in something like a Roth that never pays taxes and put that over there? instead of owning a little bit in every one. And that's usually so, instead of just talking about it, I want to show you a, um, a real world example of like a one and a half million dollar portfolio, 40% stock, 60% bonds with a trust, an IRA, and a Roth. And this is usually how it's done. This is the, it's easier to do it this way. And what happens is each of them owns the same things in it. You, you know, you go on 40, 60, 40, 60, and 40, 60. And you see the, the income from it in each of these is pretty even. You've got a little bit of everything of you know something that's not taxed much, to, you know, a little some short term isn't all of them, all right, based on how much is in it. So it's just you know it's all over. So what happens is you get sixty-five thousand in income, pay on you know, on this amount, this twenty-six thousand, you pay forty-five hundred dollars in taxes at the end of the day. So what we're doing is we're saying okay, we don't want to pay these if we don't have to. I mean, it's all the same, unless it's not, you know, unless, you know, the auto Roth IRS for something else, we can get into that, but so let's say, okay, again, 40, 60, look at it as a household, and we do some tax lot allocation. This is really how the client's end of the year report looked. So if something like, you notice this went down, it was pushed into here and over here. That tax-free, all of it's moved over here. Short term, the highest one, gone, pushed over here. And so exactly the same income, only paid $1,600 in taxes. 
saved you sixty five percent. So whatever your tax bill is, it would be you know, quite a bit more if we're not doing that. You know, then to go back, I mean, here's the thing though. The Roth IRA was 90% stocks. The IRA is at 40-60 and the trust is only at 30-60. So this one had a higher return than that one, and that one had a higher return than that one. So they're gonna be different. But at the end, if you, you look at our report that we send you that says, here's your household return, exactly the same. The difference is you get to spend more money. Same return, you get more spendable dollars, which is, I don't know about you, that's more important, yeah. is what you can spend. Does that make sense? Sure. Now, it typically only works with happily married couples. <laughs> <laughs> and if this little tax strategy starts to cause too much strife between the husband and wife, or it's going to cause a divorce, you know, we're not interested. That's a very bad financial strategy. Yeah, so here, here. if you let us know and you just say, I get it, but I, I'm good paying 65% more in tax, I just want every one of them to be just right down the middle because I can't deal with these arguments anymore, that's totally cool. You can, anyone can opt out. And here's, but here's another big part, too, of this. It cuts down transaction costs, too, because we might have all of the long-term bonds or something in here. If we need to rebalance, it's one trade. What if, if we have all three of them, that's three trades. So it cuts the transaction cost by at least you know, half to a third or to two thirds. So it saves you, you know, possibly, like on this portfolio, I looked at, I think there was 18, 19 trades over the year. That could be tripled. That's you know, another $1,000. So there's another $1,000 we save doing it that way. You know, and why this came up, one of the times it came up with you saying that, a newer client called and remember I was talking about how long-term bonds did really well at the beginning of the year. And I think the other one was real estate. His wife's Roth IRA had long-term bonds in real estate, and his had emerging market stocks. So she was up like 18, and he was down 10. And he's, he's like, like going, you've never even met her. Yeah. Why are you <laughs> favoring her? <laughs> we're like, well, we're not favoring anyone. We're just, you guys happily married? We're trying to, you know, minimize the tax for the whole family. Yeah. And, uh, and that worked out. One yeah. of the things that doesn't work out, though, it gets real, con I don't know if this is where we're going to go into the... Oh. I mean, at the go. end of the day, what happens is if you've got a, well, let's just keep using that 60-40 portfolio. If you've got a 60-40 portfolio, at, at the household level, we still maintain that 60-40 portfolio. We still maintain the same risk and return characteristics. We're still targeting the same, you know, return. All that still stays the same. But it gets really confusing if you're one of those people that's used to getting your Schwab or your TD Ameritrade statement and you look at, you know, I'm going to review, okay, you know, this is what I do every month, man. I'm going to sit down. I'm not saying you shouldn't do this. Well, let me finish. Maybe I am saying that. <laughs> if you sit down and look at each one of these statements one by one and you're going, well, you know, I added it up and this one made hardly anything. And then I look at like my, so that was my IRA and then my wife's IRA. Man, it just shot the lights out, and then her Roth IRA, man, it just stunk it all up. And then our joint trust, it was totally different than anything else. So these guys lost their minds. They don't even know what they're doing anymore over here. It, it totally, it really makes, this strategy really makes your individual brokerage statements that you're going to be getting from Schwab and TD Ameritrade pretty much meaningless. I mean, you can look at them and look at the bottom line and make sure that that matches up with the, you know, the performance reports that we give you. But what I would strongly encourage you to do is to, when you're evaluating your portfolio as far as performance is what most people are looking at, but also there's a lot of clients in the room that pay attention to risk and asset allocation and, hey, we agreed that we're going to be running a 40-60 portfolio. I want to make sure these guys are still you know, wa you know, watching what's going on with my money. But if you're looking at the performance in the in the in your asset allocation, if if you'll pay attention, if you log into alignmywealth.com and go in there and take a look at those performance reports, they all roll everything up into to where it, this is really what it's looking at, the whole household, and it'll help you really see the uh, you know really see the big big picture that way. So. And if you're not doing that, if you haven't been logging in that way, we'd encourage you to do that. Get you know. Or call us. Me, yeah. Dennis, Darling, we'll walk you through. We'll make sure that you got the right login and all that kind of stuff. 
I'm happy to do it. But that's where you're going to get the best performance information. And a lot of times, I mean, I know the Schwab and the TE statements don't even give you a rate of return number on your statement. So it's, it's much easier to measure you know, just your rate of return, which is a pretty important number. Everyone would agree. So. So in the next few weeks, uh, you're going to be getting a form from us. And here's, here's, I mean, I know we've gone over all this, we've gone over data and probabilities and taxes and asset classes, so all these terms we're using up here. But what really matters is that we're doing the best job we can to get, you know, to fund your goals, your, your dreams and when, what you want to do, when you want to do it, without any concern of running out of money. I mean, that's, that's our job. That's what we're, do, you know, that's what we're here to do for you. And so to make sure that we're doing the best job, we're going to send out, within the next few weeks, we're going to send this form to you and just make sure that we're on top of things. I know we cover a lot of this and, you know, as we go in our meetings and phone calls and things like that, but this will give you a chance, again, to sit at home and you know, think about, okay, what's concerning us and what, what goals do we have coming up and you know, what's going on in our life and maybe something, you know, sit down and, and talk about what you know, maybe something's come up that we don't know about. And then get that back to us and we'll just look at, okay, here's everything they've got. We've got this plan set aside. We've got all these cash flows and w that we're planning for. Does this match up? Does this match up with what we're doing? If not, then you know, we'll have, you know, either call you or have you come in and, and uh, work on that and make sure we're all on the same page. So you'll be getting that again, getting that mail probably <coughs> in the next week or the week after. And just, uh, so that is from us. So if you will fill that out and just get that back to us and so we can make sure that we're doing the best we can for you. I just thought I'd end on, uh, you know, 2016 was actually a pretty, pretty good year, really, in a lot of ways. And uh, the media has such, you know, a desire to just <laughs> air the dirty laundry. That's all we ever see on television is the bad. But anyway, I just thought I might close our financial discussion before we bring up uh, Mr. Romine to teach us how to get, uh, uh, healthier. Um, I just kind of looked around. I saw some stuff in, in an article and it had like 10 really cool things I thought I'd share. So factoid number one. Did you know that the U.S., the average U.S. household, I'm sorry, all, the aggregate of all households in the United States of America ended the year uh, owning 90 trillion dollars in wealth? I don't know if it was on this side or that side, but $90 trillion is a third higher than the wealth held by this country at the peak of all the markets in 2007, including the housing markets, before all that fell off the wheels. So I thought that was a pretty cool little thing to recognize. Well, that again? That again? At the end of 2016, the aggregate uh, net worth of all U.S. households no, about $90 trillion, a third higher than it was at the peak in 2007 before everything fell apart in 08. Are you with me? Pretty cool, huh? Now we all know that the housing market completely went off the track, right? A lot of people lost a lot of money, foreclosed out and all that kind of stuff. Well, the average price of a single family home in the United States surpassed the 2007 peak in 2016. Hmm. Pretty cool. The cancer death rate in the United States has dropped 25% since 1991, according to the American Cancer Society. How many people in this room have either dealt personally with cancer or know someone who died or dealt with it? 25% reduction. I mean, that's, that's, I don't know about you, but that's pretty positive that I like to kind of recognize. The U.S. household debt ratio uh, ended at its lowest level since I was a junior in high school, and that was a long time That's ago. A long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> no. Factoid number five: the cash dividend on the S&P 500 index reached a new all-time high in 16, and at $45. That's seven times what it was when I was a junior in high school in 1980. Now think about what's happened to interest rates since 1980. I remember you guys talking about them in the kitchen, Ann and Bill, and they went from like 15 or 16 to what, about zero right now? So that's something. Uh, a lot of people in the room know that I really like the beach. Humpback whales, giant pandas, green sea turtles, and manatees were all taken off of the endangered species list in 2016. Yeah. You ever seen a manatee? So cool. And they're just sitting ducks, you know, for the. 
Uh, so factoid number seven, three decades after the banning of aerosol products containing fluorocarbons, uh, scientists at MIT have found that the ozone layer appears to be repairing itself. They estimate that the hole in the ozone layer above the South Pole has shrunk by 1.5 million square miles, and it looks like it's going to close itself by the year 2050. Hmm. Pretty good stuff, huh? Al Gore to win. Huh? Is Al Gore to win? I don't think this had anything to do with Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> We ought to make him aware of this. <laughs> the internet does, though. You, I'll give this to you. You can send it to him like this. <laughs> Item number eight, cash reserves of the S&P 500 companies ended the year roughly 30% of current assets. I mean, that kind of war chest will probably allow them to weather some pretty bad times, no matter what the future holds going forward. Now, I did uh, have the opportunity to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to listen to this guy sing. And it, it was hard to listen to him sing. It's terrible. But man, can he write a song. And Bob Dylan was recognized. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2016, and nobody is more deserving, in my opinion. That guy has written, you ought to look up all the songs Bob Dylan's written if you don't know. It's, un, it's unbelievable. You just can't understand him if he's singing it. But when he sings, you can't understand the dang thing he's saying. It's like, all alone on watch shower. Uh, he wouldn't go pick up his award. Do what? He wouldn't go pick up his award. Oh, really? No, he didn't well, go over and pick it up. He's, he's out there, but, but, the, but the guy can write. The guy can write. I mean, he's written some love songs that make you cry, Colonel. <laughs> Maybe. I'm not sure about that. Uh, and number 10 on this list, the U.S. unemployment rate sunk to a low of 4.5%. Uh, more people with more jobs, we all know that's good for this country, right? Everybody agree? So I just thought it would be good. I mean, given the media's penchant for just negative, 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 it's the end of the world. It's the worst start to the stock markets in the history of the, you know, and it ends up, you know, is just to recognize it because I think they're powerful reminders of a bigger truth that, you know, on, on average or on balance, I guess I would say, the world's getting freer, healthier, cleaner, and richer than we've ever been. Uh, but you wouldn't know it if you pay attention to the headlines every day. I mean, so just, you know, maybe, maybe turn that kind of stuff on. But here's the bottom line. No matter how much money we have, it's real hard to enjoy our wealth if we don't have our health. So with that said, is Mr. Romine in the room where yeah. he can... Uh, He's ready to do push-ups. Please teach us how to be healthier. Because <laughs> if we're not healthy, we can't enjoy any of our okay. money. So. I'm not used to seeing so many people actually sit down, so it's a little different for me. Uh, my name is Travis Romine. I've been the director of fitness out here at Oak Tree for the last 13 years uh, in the industry for 16. I know a few of you in the room, you know me pretty well. Um, typically, I'm here to talk about the benefits of health and wellness and how it pertains to your life. Okay, good. Now, when I meet with people, I usually like to talk about the negatives first. I like to get that out there so they know exactly what they're dealing with. Okay, number one, sedentary lifestyles lead to increased chronic diseases, diabetes, uh, cancers, uh, hypertension, obesity, all that stuff right there. That's something that really is a big epidemic these days. Uh, number two, overall life expectancy is greatly decreased. Now, I, I read a lot of Warren Buffett, and he is a very big advocate for wellness and health. Um, I don't even know how old he is, to tell you the truth, but he works out every single day. And he says, basically, um, you got one body, you need to use it. He's like, and if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's, that's true right there. Uh, lack of movement leads to all kinds of problems, especially when it comes to uh, less circulation in the body. You know, things like that just start to break down. And number one, it leads to the last one, which I explained to people, high health care costs. Okay, the average cost of a surgery, um, my wife had scoliosis, it was almost a $300,000 surgery. That just happened about probably three years ago. So medications are on the rise, everything out there these days is expensive. So if there's something you can do now that could be just something as simple as, you know, a small workout here and there, something that's gonna make you guys a little bit more active, that will greatly save on your, especially your savings. So I was like, saving money is a good thing. Okay, next one, so now the positives. This is pretty much just the reverse, the opposite direction. Okay, an active lifestyle. Now we're not talking you have to go out and run a marathon or anything like that, but just simply 
moving is gonna reduce those risks. Okay, it's gonna cut down on you know, all kinds of heart diseases, uh, other chronic illnesses, especially you know, your immune system. Now, a lot of people get sick, pneumonia, flu, uh, things like that that we deal with, especially in the gym. I usually have to tell people to sanitize 24 seven because we're touching everything. Last thing you wanna do is get sick and all of a sudden be knocked up in the hospital. Um, number two, or number three, I'm sorry, it lowers blood pressure, keeps a good, steady, healthy heart. Uh, delays the onset of osteoporosis, which bone loss is, is a big thing, like especially with a lot of my clients. Um, lowers cholesterol, but the last one is my favorite. It increases vitality, increases energy, which leads to a longer and happier life. Like right now is the time where people that retire and everything, that's when I want them to enjoy their life the most. A lot of my clientele is the average age of 55 up to 90. Um, their best years are usually in those latter years right there because they've taken care of their money, they've taken care of their health, and they've gone on and actually travel the world, do whatever they invite me to go quite a bit, but I usually just go to Vegas. That's my favorite part right there. Um, so that's the best part of it right there. Now, exercise usually is attributed to uh, a negative uh, little, I guess, uh, thought process. It's painful. It, it really is. I mean, I know a lot of people have been to my classes. It hurts, but you can do it your own way. So, um, like I said, it doesn't matter what your, your health goals are. It doesn't matter how hard you push. Doing something is better than nothing. Okay, so like I said, I specialize in 10-minute workouts daily. Okay, typically, I will get a person down there on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and put them through resistance training. I've designed the gym and multiple gyms around the state to be in circular motions to where you can go in 10 minute workouts on Monday Wednesday Friday with resistance whether it be machines bands dumbbells doesn't matter on Tuesdays Thursdays and Saturdays those are our cardiovascular days that's where you can go play golf I encourage you to walk when you play golf that still don't happen but still it's at least it's out there swimming uh, cycling anything like that to get you guys moving taking a walk uh, and then on Sundays we call it rest and recovery day or I call it active recovery day and that's yoga stretching whatever it is you do now if you don't have the patience like I do to stretch that long five minutes is still better than nothing so but it all leads into where I spend most of my time and that's nutrition 90% of this game is nutrition now that's okay all that stuff there like that see that's what IIFYM stands for if it fits your macronutrients okay this is a type of eating plan that we help design that allows you to eat anything you want to as long as you're willing to track it okay everybody needs a certain amount of proteins carbohydrates and fats to get a common goal if you want to lose weight gain muscle mass whatever it is you want to do you want to sleep better we can manipulate your carbohydrates proteins and fats to be able to fit your lifestyle anywhere you go it doesn't matter you don't have to sit there and carry a Weight Watchers book with you um, you do have to carry an app so you can track it but at the same time if you don't like doing that we can do it for you so it's one of those things where it's real simple if you get into the rhythm of it and the last one is keto I don't know if anybody's heard of ketogenic eating all that is basically is where we take uh, basically the carbohydrates or the the bad stuff the good stuff out of your eating plan to replace it with fibrous vegetables, increase your fat intake, and moderate your protein. Okay, now all this stuff is all well and good and everything like that, but we call that one the CEO diet right there. It allows you to go to meetings all day long, do what you want to do, and still not have to sit there and interfere with your eating schedule and your goals that you have to get done. So the next slide are two of my biggest people that uh, actually had the best uh, results off of a ketogenic eating plan. This is Pat and Marie Dugan. They did an eight week program with us that did not e exceed more than 10 minute workouts a day okay eight weeks straight eight weeks that was it and they did it to the T I mean they said that they didn't want to do anything hardcore and that's fine because consistency is how this ball keeps rolling okay littlest things in the world and the best part about it was you know he lost almost 40 pounds and almost what was it 14 percent of his body mass and Marie beat him and that wasn't he wasn't too happy about that because she lost more body mass but they both once again improved their quality of life uh, Anne Marie is a professional bowler and travels the entire country and she needed to have that in her life okay Pat is her manager goes with her at the same time plays a lot of golf he was having all kinds of hip problems knees elbows everything all of a sudden those things are eliminated when you're 40 pounds lighter okay at the same time no more medications which saves them money okay that's the number one thing I want them to do is save as much money as possible okay because like I said down the long run it's gonna be expensive and that's the one thing I definitely don't want people to spend all their lifelong hard-earned money on medications surgeries so on and so forth and uh, you know for goodness sakes like retirement communities one of these days in Key West or wherever it is those places are and the last one more energy that's all they wanted in the very beginning what they got was ten times more okay so basically that's all it is like there the, the Q&A side of this is where I really specialize in it I mean if you guys have questions fire off I was like I like answering questions it doesn't bother me one bit so go right ahead anybody um. You don't have to be nervous. I will not yell. I promise. So, I yes. Your, your one, one part of the plan calls for working out. Can 
minutes a day? I have people that, that do. It's all like eating like a rabbit or what are you talking about? No, no. Yeah, not, uh, like literally when you walk by, I walked by and saw everything over there. I, I see food different. I see your plate as proteins, carbs, and fats. I don't see it as flavor. I've never eaten that way. I wrestled my whole life. So we ate pretty much the same thing every single day. But um, all you do is like typically I work with a lot of CEOs downtown that they see the foods and all they do is they basically break it down into a protein, a carb, and a fat. So if I was to tell you that it, one day you're allowed 200 grams of carbohydrates, all you have to do is manage it. You know, it's just basically a, a give and take system. So if you want to go to a Thunder game, have two beers and a Thunder Dog or whatever those things are called, <laughs> you can have that and it not, it's not going to affect you because all it is is thermodynamics, okay? You're allowed a certain amount of calories to lose weight. All you have to do is just burn a little bit more than that. So five to ten minute workouts are better than nothing right there. And that's the best part of it is because you don't have to kill yourself to get the results that you want. I mean, the thing of it is, is I mean, life's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to just be horrible. Trust me, I've been there too many times and I don't like it, but at the same time, I love 10 minute workouts every single day. You might squeak in maybe two or three in a day if you really want to, but it's on your time and that's it. Don't you have uh like videos or something while these yes. workouts? Yes, yes. I actually also own uh, Romine Fitness LLC where we post workout videos every day. They're all 10 minutes long. Uh, they're on Instagram. I would not do the internet just yet because uh, that's a pain right there. We've done the website thing, but that will be in the future. Um, but at the same time, if you want, leave all your information with Dennis like that. I will email those to you. It could be anything you could possibly think of, whether it be, like I said, machines, rubber bands, calisthenics, push-ups, pull-ups. That's been the, the norm ever since my father was in the military. It still works to this day. So I was like, you can do pretty much anything you want to. What's yes. What's that? What's the average carb loss on 10 minute average work? Say you have an average work in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. How many carbs can you burn? Carbohydrates, well, four grams per calorie, probably in 10 minutes, probably about 100 calories, but that's not the case. The, the afterburn effect is what we're trying to do, that thermic effect. Okay, so you're gonna work out 10 minutes, your afterburn effect is 24 to 48 hours after that, depending on what you're doing. So if I was to bring you in and say, okay, on Mondays, we're gonna focus on nothing but pushing motions for 10 minutes, push-ups, military press, uh, leg press, things like that, I'm gonna tax your entire body. Okay, and then on top of that, too, I'm gonna let you rest for a couple days. That after effect is gonna be burning while you're sleeping. Sleeping is where you lose the weight, guys. It's not when you're in the gym, trust me. I was like, you gotta get that sleep, and the sleep is recovery, so. The result is just an additional, say, that 100 calories you burn during the actual process, three to 400 calories later. Now you multiply that by the end of the day, 3,500 calories is in one pound. You know, you do you know, seven workouts in a week, you could lose upwards of a half a pound to a pound per week and keep it healthy, smooth, and steady. You lose 52 pounds in a year after 52 weeks. This looks pretty good to me. Like I said, then everything, yes? Mm -hmm. um, I'm a health consultant with nutritionist and I have diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yes. The first time I've ever looked at this zero box. Mm -hmm. I usually looked at the sugar and the salt. And mm -hmm. too. But it's 45 grams of carbs. And yes. You just get a meal. Mm -hmm. hard because some of these things have pretty good carbs. Oh, yes. Well, and, that, uh, yes, that's, that's the... You, you can, but that's the thing. That's what the, uh, the beautiful thing about it is, is we'll educate you on that as well. Um, when you take in carbohydrates, your body releases insulin, okay? Insulin is going to store fat, okay? It's what the body's natural ability is to do is to pump it into the muscle cells. When it's full, it's going to overflow, okay? So the trick of it is, my wife also uh, has those problems. Um, after the age of 35, a lot of the times females have a hard time processing carbohydrates. So the thing is, you don't have to cut that out, but there's a less of a response when you keep it to around 15 grams of carbohydrates in one sitting. You space that out over time. So if we were to say the traditional keto diet will allow a person to have about close to 50 grams per day. Now, if you're doing it the right way, um, sure, you can sneak in a bowl of cereal if you want to, but it's an actual serving size. If you ever looked at a real serving size, it's a fourth of a cup. There's nothing there. You might as well just stick it in your mouth and chew it. So, yes, pasta, the same thing. The average serving size of, uh, like, any pasta, if you go to Othello's uh, Olive Garden, that's four servings. That's 150 grams of carbs in one shot, okay? You, you eat that right there, not only you're bloated like that, but at the same time, your body's still processing that. So while your body's processing, anything else that goes in with it, wine, bread, anything like that, it's all just getting pushed to the wayside and hanging. It's not just going to go right in and out. We're not goose or geese, whatever you call it, yeah. but it's just not the way the body works, okay? You can't overload it with something when your body's not as active. Now, all of a sudden, you start getting active, great. I was like, then all of a sudden, you'll start noticing you can have more carbs with less of the effect. 
right there. It's just, it's one of those things where you got to give a little bit and you can take a little. But over time, like with them, Pat and Anne Marie, those guys now, I don't even know what they eat to tell you the truth. So, but it is, it is possible, yes. And for people that have diabetes and everything like that, it's, it's an insulin spike is what it is. But if you can control it, you can have anything you want. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, see, that's the thing. That's what's great about my job is I'm not a nutritionist, so I never recommend meal plans. I will give you the basics and break down when it comes to your proteins, carbs, and fat needs, also fiber. And then after that, if you still can't seem to grasp that, like what we're trying to get done, then I'll send you to a nutritionist and things like that. But typically, I try to stay as close to whole foods as possible, as close to nature if you can, but it's boring. I was like, don't get me wrong, I want to eat pizza too at the same time and, uh, or anything else. I like ice cream. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, sir. You mentioned uh, limit on protein or protein limit. Uh, yes. Follow up on that? A protein limit, like um, depending on which uh, program you're doing. Traditionally, people would say one gram per pound of body weight, lean body mass. So if we brought you in, did an actual like DEXA scan on you, we saw that um, if you weighed 160 pounds and your protein needs would be about maybe 130. Okay, we'd put you at about right there. But the great thing about those types of IIFYM or keto, you can be manipulated. So we would go a week or two and see how your body mass is doing. If we're not seeing any changes, we can modify that. And also, the great thing about it is, is um, um, with keto, you don't have to take in as much protein. See, protein can still be broken down as glucose in the body. So whenever it's dropped down a little bit lower, and, everything, and a lot of the times, you know, bodybuilding.com, a lot of the big time lifters and everything yeah, say you need, protein. yeah, you need 300 grams a day. Well, it's just going in and going right back out. There's no, there's no thermic effect to it. So realistically, you can actually eat a smaller amount of protein and a higher uh, concentration of fats, avocados, nuts, seeds like that, and get a better benefit, more energy, more brain function, uh, everything like that and when they get that right there then all of a sudden you hit that what call they call a natural high and that's 10 times easier for you to, to process without having to be all gunked up and feeling bloated nasty I, trust me don't eat that much protein you know what it feels like to eat a ton then all of a sudden a big steak and then you're just you don't want to go to sleep so yes sir what do you not want to eat to sleep better you, just, you mentioned that, that was the thing yeah when you go to bed at night typically your body's shutting down after about probably two o'clock in the afternoon it's starting to drop itself down to where it's going to you know release those serotonin levels so you can sleep at night the last thing you want to do is throw sugar in the mix uh, a high concentration of carbohydrates which is a lot of people they go out and they eat a pasta dinner or something like that and then all of a sudden they're still sitting cereal. up a cereal too I do that that's yeah and, and that's the thing it's, it's one of those things where as long as you were doing cereal at the pro, like like i said like the portion control that they wanted you to do but every person just pours that bowl over there and they just fill it up well that's three servings so all of a sudden you're taking in not like what type of cereal is cocoa, cocoa, you know. cocoa Krispies yeah. or something like there you go so loaded with sugar the average I think it's okay yeah. cocoa pebbles so you'd say for per serving it's about 24 to 25 grams of sugar that's one coke right there that's one actual can of coke right there okay you eat three servings of that you're not going to bed and even if you do all night long is when your body's mending and losing weight okay but if you throw that in there all of a sudden that fires pumping right back up you're not sleeping you're not recovering if you're not recovering your muscles aren't mending those muscles aren't mending, you're not burning fat. So what kind of snack can you have? Dark chocolate. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Not, like 70% dark chocolate. I actually learned this in Napa Valley. They were like, you know, dark chocolate only has about five grams of carbohydrates per serving. Big square. You can get Giardelli's. I believe they have that up at uh, Uptown. A few places like that. You can get 70% or you can get real dark chocolate. You can barely even bite into. Yeah, but awesome. um, my wife usually has about three servings of those per night. And it's only right around with the fiber content in it as well. It's about 10 grams of carbs. No insulin spikes. And she sleeps like a baby. And she's happy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there a tracking app that you recommend? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you've got two or three different versions. My Fitness Pal is the biggest one on the market right now, but it's very complex. Okay, it's very difficult. Lose It is the easiest one I've ever found. I hate to say it, it's remedial, but it works. I was like, it's one of the easiest things. Once you log it into your, your database, it's in there for good. So when you pull it up, it's going to know what you're used to eating. So then you can just lose it. Yes. Just lose it app is all it is. It's got a little scale on an orange scale. And uh, like I said, when I wake up in the morning, I can click those three buttons and it automatically pulls it up. It tells me my sugar intake, my fiber intake, which is something that's neglected a lot right there. Because what people don't realize is you can still eat those carbs 
as long as your fiber content's up high so it's gonna pull away that negative effect. So fiber is a great thing to have in the body. Broccoli is good right there. You can do it any way you want to. You can do it through a powdered version. It doesn't matter. But I mean, you're gonna need a lot of broccoli to get about 30 grams in. So that's about four bags of those steamer bags if you really wanna munch into it, so. Go for it. But like I said, I, any questions you guys ever have, I'm, I've been here forever. They got a chain and ball way down there at the bottom of the hill. That's where I stay. So I'm up on the second floor. And you can find me there at 4 a.m. every morning. It's been like that for years. But uh, anybody have questions anymore? None. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, this is first. Nobody claps. So. No problem at all. So I'll just close it up by thanking everybody for taking your time to be here. I hope it was, uh, you know, enjoyable and got some good information. Appreciate Some faces in the room have been around here for decades, so thank you for your continued trust and confidence. And this is our tribe, man. We're here to take care of you guys, so call on us, please. Uh, if there's people in the room that are guests, happy to give you a second opinion about what you might be doing. Uh, just jot down your uh, info, and, and we'd be happy to sit with you and see if we might be able to add a little value. And uh, that's it. Happy Friday night. Happy uh, weekend. There's more food.